So it should be a part, as we saw, of management report. According to these two accounting and non-financial reporting directives, management report, which is also one kind of non-financial reports, should consist of the content prescribed by the accounting directive. It should also include the non-financial statement and the corporate governance statement. So, let's see what the content of the management report is according to the, no, uh, to the accounting directive. So, uh, it should have a fair review of the development and performance of the undertaking's business and of its position, included information on environmental and employee matters. So something related to sustainability. Also, together with a description of the principal risks and uncertainties. It should also contain uh, future development, research and development, acquisitions of own shares, existence of branches, financial risk management objectives and policies, exposure to price risk, that's something that's quite relevant these days, then credit risk, liquidity risk, and cash flow risk information. In addition, it should contain the non-financial statement according to the non-financial reporting directive. So, the non-financial statement should have a brief description of the undertaking's business model, then a description of the policies pursued by the undertaking in relation to those matters, and those matters are, as we saw in the uh, definition, uh, environmental, social, and uh, governance matters, including due diligence processes implemented. Then it should have outcome of just mentioned policies, the principal risks which are related to those matters, linked to the undertaking's operations, including its business relationships, product or services, which are likely to cause adverse impact in those areas, and how the undertaking manages those risks. And finally, it should contain non-financial key performance indicators or KPIs which are relevant to the particular business. So that is the content of the financial statement, which has to be, by certain large undertakings, included in their management report. And finally, management report uh, consists also of the governance, corporate governance statement, which contains a corporate governance code to which the undertaking is subject, which the undertaking may have voluntarily decided to apply and all relevant information about its practices apply. Then, where an undertaking departs from or does not refer to any provisions of a corporate governance code, there should be an explanation as to which parts and the reasons for doing or not doing so. Then uh, there should be a description of the main features of the undertaking's internal control and risk management systems in relation to the financial reporting process, the information on takeover bids, a of the operation of the shareholder meeting and its key powers and a description of shareholders' rights and how they can be exercised, then the composition and operation of administrative management and supervisory bodies and their committees. So all this is prescribed by the accounting directive, but non-financial reporting directive, which amends the accounting directive, also states that the governance statement should contain a description of the diversity policy applied in relation to its administrative, management, and supervisory bodies. For example, their age, gender, or educational and professional backgrounds, and of course, its objectives. So, having all this in mind, we can definitely say that management report with these two statements is definitely a non-financial report. 
So that's about law regulations on non-financial reporting. Besides the law regulations, regulatory framework of non-financial reporting also uh, considers the report, uh, social responsibility reporting standards. In that context, the non-financial reporting directive mentions that these certain large undertakings who are obliged to prepare a non-financial statement, they can relate to national frameworks, union-based frameworks, for example, the eco-management and audit scheme, or international frameworks from the aspect of social responsibility reporting standards, which they apply for preparing the non-financial state. International frameworks are those most commonly used and that's why the directive also refers to some of them. So although here are, uh, here we have six international frameworks, that's not definite list and I also have to mention that uh, the first one is not the one which is most commonly used and the uh, last one uh, at least uh, commonly used, but it's a random uh, list of international frameworks and also the uh, non-financial reporting directive uh, is not limited to these international frameworks, but it says that companies can also choose some other international frameworks to base their non-financial statements on them. Uh, here I would like to uh, finish with my first uh, lecture, with first subchapter of uh, these non-financial reporting practices, because this will be our starting point for the next one, which is about analysis of social responsibility reporting standards and frameworks. So, as I mentioned at the very end of my first lecture, the Non-Financial Reporting Directive proposes some international reporting frameworks and standards which companies can use when reporting on non-financial and sustainability information. I'm also pointing out uh, that uh, according to the directive, companies can choose some other international standards, meaning that Social, social responsibility reporting standards are not prescribed by any regulation from the uh, European Union perspective. So, let's start with the first one we have here, and these are the UN Global Compact standards. So, uh, in September 2015, all uh, 193 member states of the United Nations adopted a plan that lays out a path to end extreme poverty, fight inequality and injustice, and protect our planet. Uh, this path is written in the Agenda 2030, which came into force on 1st January 2016, and it comprises the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. By 2030, with these goals that uh, universally apply to all, countries should mobilize great efforts to achieve the specific goals set in the SDGs, and by that to achieve the main goal of this agenda. Uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning of my first lecture, financial information is not enough to shareholders and stakeholders anymore. Uh, nowadays, uh, consumers and uh, investors are better informed than ever before and they want businesses to take responsibility regarding environmental, social and governance matters. So business leaders and investors are aware that it is not enough for companies to concern themselves only with short-term profits, 
but they have to care about the long-term prosperity for all. So in this regard, business sector should play an important role to make it happen. Uh, each of these standards, you see, we all have to contribute to them. So each and every of us should give our contribution to reach the set targets, but companies also. So all these 17 SDGs are set on the 10 fundamental principles by the UN Corporate Global Compact. So corporate sustainability starts with a, a company's value system and a principle-based approach to doing business. Uh, operating in sustainable way implies meeting at least fundamental responsibilities in the areas of human rights, labor, environment and anti-corruption. All of the 10 principles of the UN Global Compact are distributed among these areas, as you can see on this slide. So by incorporating these principles into business strategies, policies, procedures, and by establishing a culture of integrity, companies are upholding their primary responsibilities and they are moving toward long-term success. Uh, it has to be pointed out that uh, these 10 principles are derived from the Universal Decla Declaration of uh, Human Rights, the International Labour Organization's Declaration, the Rio Declar Declaration on uh, Environment and Development, and uh, from the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. Some of these uh, I will mention in the forthcoming slides. So, for companies to be able to prepare sustainability reports, it is crucial to be uh, familiarized with the SDGs. To familiarize you with the SDGs, I have chosen the SDG 12. So first, each standard consists of targets and each target has one or more indicators by which we monitor and measure the achievement of each target. SDG 12, uh, which stands for Ensuring Sustainable Consumption and Production Patterns, is made up of 11 targets and 13 indicators. So, it covers measures of sustainable production and consumption patterns in uh, the first and the second target. Uh, it also covers many measures on waste reduction, the third, fourth and fifth uh, target. It also promotes the availability of relevant sustainability information at both companies level in sixth and seventh target and people's level uh, in eighth target. Then uh, target 12A focuses uh, on support of sustainable patterns regarding consumption and production, while target 12B focuses on the monitoring of sustainable tourism. The last target focuses on market desertations reductions to combat baseful consumption. Moving forward to show you how the indicators look like, here are two examples. The first one is target 12.5, which says that we should, by 2030, sustain, uh, substantially reduce waste generation through prevention, reduction, recycling, and reuse. The indicator for measuring the achievement of the set target refers to, as you can see, national recycling rates and tons of material recycled. So from the aspect of reporting, 
companies that prioritize this standard, SDG 12, and particularly this target, should report on the quantity of recycled materials. The other example refers to the encouragement of companies, especially large and transnational companies, to adopt uh, sustainable practices and to integrate sustainability information into their reporting cycle. So, each company publishing a sustainability report contributes in achieving this target. Uh, in addition to the indicators associated to each target, the European Union set the EU SDG indicator set for each SDG. Uh, behind all these indicators are sets of data that are collected at the European Union level and uh, based on which we can monitor progress towards the SDGs on the EU level. So uh, the data are publicly uh, available through the European Commission data browser Eurostat and they are free of charge for downloading in Excel format, among other formats, of course, in which one can make desired presentations of the European level uh, data indicators. So to show you just from uh, one angle how it can look like, I've chosen the indicator 1241, circular material use, uh, which measures the share of material recovered and fed back into the economy in overall material use. So, the circular material use, which is also known as uh, circularity rate, is defined as the ratio of the circular use of materials to the overall material use. So, what I have done, I exported the data and uh, made a graphical representation of the circular material use rate for six countries involved in this project and the EU27 average from 2016 to 2020. Uh, a higher circularity rate value indicates that more secondary materials substitute for, for uh, primary materials uh, and thus reducing the environmental impact of extracting primary material. So, we can clearly see that the circular material use rate uh, in the Czech Republic shows the greatest increase from 2016, exceeding the EU average in 2020. Uh, this very nice example of sustainability practices uh, can also be seen in the oral concept of the Czech University of Life Sciences Prague, where you have a precious opportunity to be right now. So I can only say that uh, all the other countries should follow good practices and examples of the Czech Republic and also all the university from the uh, Czech University of Life Sciences in Prague. So moving forward. Uh, international organizations uh, dealing with sustainability as well as experts from different fields often joins, uh, join their forces to make a broader impact. One of the extremely valuable groups in the field of sustainable development that must be mentioned is the CFO Coalition of, for the SDGs and that uh, platform which represents the CFO task force for the SDGs and they played a key role in shaping the sustainability agenda of CFOs. One of their goals is to accelerate the progress 
in aligned corporate investments with the SDGs and linking corporate finance to relevant and credible SDG targets. Uh, this includes a set of four CFO principles on integrated SDG investments and finance, KPIs to set targets and measure progress in the implementation of those principles, and detailed guidance and resources for CFOs of any UN global compact companies to integrate the SDGs in corporate finance. Uh, since we are currently having our focus on CSI reporting, we are going to have a deeper insight into the principle four, integrated SDG communication and reporting. Uh, according to the principle four, uh, business should engage in proactive investor communication about their SDG impact thesis, strategy and investments, including through investors' call and engagement, annual financial state uh, disclosures, and integrated financial and sustainability reports. They should enhance integrated reporting practices with key elements of SDG-aligned investments and finance, including impact measurement and valuation, alignment of investments with strategy, and accounting and monitoring performance. In addition, they should work with rating agencies, external auditors and second-party opinion providers to ensure the relevance and accuracy of publicly disclosed information and data related to SDG impact, SDG-aligned investments and SDG-linked finance. And finally, they should work with peer companies and standard setters to harmonize practices and maximize the utility of integrated reporting by promoting simplification, readability and a balance between innovation and comparability. The other world most famous organization is Global Reporting Initiative. The Global Reporting Initiative standards represent the global best practices for external reporting on a range of economic, environmental and social impacts. Sustainability reporting based on uh, this, these standards provide uh, information about an organization's positive but also negative contributions to sustainable development. So, the Global Reporting Initiative Standards are uh, a modular or is a modular system of interle interrelated standards. Uh, there are three series of standards supporting the reporting process. So, there are the Global Reporting Initiative Universal Standards, which apply to all organizations. Then the Global Reporting Initiative Sector Standards, applicable to specific sectors, and each company should use those standards that apply to its sectors. And from the third model of standards, uh, Global Reporting Initiative Topic Standards, a company has to select topic standards relevant for reporting specific information on its material topics. Using these standards uh, to determine what topics are material or relevant uh, helps organizations to achieve sustainable development. So companies can use the whole set of global reporting initiative standards or just those standards of their interest but uh, it's important to note that um, whichever way it chooses, a company is obliged to include a corresponding claim or statement of use of these standards. So that is something uh, I, I suppose I think quite, some, quite familiar to, to you since uh, all of us have to properly reference 
the sources when we write either students' professional or scientific papers. So companies should also do that when uh, using the global reporting initiative standards. Uh, here you can see a scheme for sustainability reporting using the global reporting initiative standards. Uh, but I would rather uh, show you how the standards look like on the example of one of these standards. So, as an example, uh, to familiarize you with the standard structure, I've chosen a Global Reporting Initiative uh, 306, which is intended to waste, and which has been in force from the beginning of uh, this year. So, the structure of the standards is not completely equal in all standards, but the differences are minor. Uh, focusing on this Global Reporting Initiative 306 standard, uh, this standard starts with the introduction, where we can find important information such as the standard structure, its background, the system of the uh, standards in general, as well as uh, instructions for implementing the standard into the company's reporting process. Then there come topic management disclosures uh, required for all companies that use this standard. And this means that each company that has determined waste to be a material topic is required to report how it manages the topic using disclosure standard material topics as well as any disclosures from this section, so 3061 and 3062. Uh, also, they have to be relevant to its waste-related impact. Uh, disclosures 106, uh, 1 and 2 consists of the requirements, uh, which a company must report, then recommendations, which a company should report, if it found to have a significant, significant waste-related impact, and guidance on the disclosures to ease their understanding and reporting relevance. Uh, each of these disclosures is one and a half page long and is written in very simple and understandable language. Uh, then there come Topics disclosures on waste generated, waste uh, diverted from disposal, and waste directed to disposal. Uh, each of the disclosures consists of requirements and guidance, and some of them also of uh, recommendations, and they also are from one to two pages long. After this main part, there is a glossary with definitions for terms used in this standard, uh, which make standard uh, even more understandable and understood in a unique way worldwide. Uh, then it is followed by bibliography that lists uh, intergovernmental instructions and additional references used in developing the standard. And finally, there is an appendix with uh, process flow examples, which are presented graphically, and also template examples for presenting information for disclosures 306, 3, 4, and 5. Um, so here you can see uh, the template from the Global Reporting Initiative standard of the day. Uh, I said that these examples uh, can be amended based on a company's needs. And as you can see, the example tables are simple and understandable and also connected with the section which they refer to. Uh, except, uh, except the world's most famous frameworks, 
and these are the UN Global Compact and the Global Reporting Initiative. And there are another valuable frameworks, guidelines and standards that uh, I will now present but in brief. So here you can see the content of the guiding principles on business and human rights implementing the UN Protect. The first section from the content, then respect, the second section, and remedy framework, the third section. Uh, as you can see, each of these sections is divided into two parts, referring to the fundamental and operational principles. As I mentioned at the beginning, each of the international frameworks set uh, its general sustainability principles, and this framework sets three of them. Uh, moving forward to the content, each of the three sections start with foundational principles, which are followed by commentaries that explain the principles in detail. And after that, then come operational principles, also followed by commentaries. Another international set uh, refers to the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises that are actually uh, recommendations addressed by governments to multinational enterprises. And they provide non-binding principles and standards for responsible business conduct in a global context, uh, consistent also with applicable laws and internationally recognized standards. Uh, these guidelines are not only uh, multilaterally agreed, but uh, they are comprehensive code of, of responsible business conduct that uh, governments have uh, committed to promoting. Uh, these guidelines are divided into two parts, where the first part refers to recommendations for sustainable business conduct in a global context, while the second part refers to the implementation procedures. So, moving forward, then we have the most accepted global framework to leverage the implementation of CSR or just SR uh, and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So, uh, ISO 26000 has been translated into 30 languages and transformed into national standards in more than 80 countries. Uh, this international standard is intended to be useful to all types of organizations in the private, public and non-profit sectors, uh, whether large or small and whether operating in developing or developed countries. So uh, the international Standard 26000 distinguishes seven social responsibility core subjects uh, from organizational governance to community involvement and development. Uh, all seven core subjects are relevant for every organization. Uh, in total, 37 uh, social responsibility issues have been described within this standard, uh, although not, of course, all uh, social responsibility issues have to be relevant for every organization. And finally, the International Labour Organization's uh, three-party declaration of principles concerning multinational enterprises and social policy. Uh, this declaration is the only international labor organization's instrument that provides direct guidance to enterprises, national and multinational, on uh, social policy and inclusive, responsible and sustainable workplace practices. 
Uh, it is the only global instrument in this area and the only one that was elaborated and adopted by governments, employers and workers from around the world. Uh, it was adopted 40 years ago and it was amended several times, most recently in March 27, and this is the publication you can see on this slide. So, uh, as you see in the contents of the declaration, it provides guidance in such areas as employment, training, conditions of uh, work and life, and industrial relations. Uh, the guidance is uh, founded substantially on principles contained in the international labor standards. So, to conclude this uh, chapter, uh, when we uh, covered all these standards and frameworks uh, for environmental, social and governance reporting, uh, for the very end, I would like to emphasize a great contribution of all the international organizations who share their knowledge, which is packed in such valuable standards and frameworks, but also in all other kind of their work, uh, by which I mean uh, regularly published reports conducting surveys and publishing the, re the results, uh, discussions on relevant topics, and many, many more. On the other hand, it is also worth to mention that companies invest their great efforts in preparation of non-financial statements or reports, or CSR reports, however we call them. And there are many wonderful examples of such kind of reports worldwide. You will also see that when you start exploring and searching for one company's CSR or non-financial report, which uh, you're going to present to your colleagues on Friday. So that would be it for the first two uh, chapters from me. Uh, I suppose we should go for a break now.